Hey everyone, welcome back to Tiered Apologetics. Pumped you're joining us today to have Eric Manning from the YouTube channel Testify. We're going to be talking about the minimal facts argument um, and specifically like what's wrong with it potentially and like looking at a different route. So Eric, what's up, man? How you doing? Good, man. I appreciate you having me on, Zach. Yeah, I'm super pumped and I'm going to try to ignore that Cardinals hat the whole time we're doing this. And yeah, have <laughs> Here, a good I'll, time. I'll, so, I'll turn it back. There we go. Way. There we go. Okay. All is better in the world. Um, so yeah, so to get things started, do you want to talk about like who you are and what you do and like what kind of got you into like looking at like minimal facts versus maximal data and stuff like that? Sure. Um, I run the YouTube channel Testify Apologetics, um, which uh, apparently I hit 1 million views today. I just got the little Ooh. little notification. So yeah, if, um, okay. I was surprised my hat still fits on my head because it's getting so big, you know. But uh, <laughs> no, I've been running the channel for uh, posting regularly since about January 2021. And um, mostly about historical apologetics. Uh, I also talk about the argument from miracles, um, you know, reliability of the gospels, deity of Christ. And uh, sometimes I'll talk about like modern miracles and different things like that. Um, what got me interested in the whole minimal facts, maximal data thing um, was just uh, some materials from Lydia McGrew, um, who uh, the McGrews are... Um, I know them a little bit and uh, kind of picked their brain on a few things. And um, yeah, I, I was always really big into like the minimal facts approach. Um, but she's kind of pointed out some areas where even in sharing the minimal facts approach with like non-believers, I would reach these impasses like really, really quick. And I'm like, well, I think this is kind of a good argument. What, what actually is wrong with this? And kind of find out it's just leads to a very weak conclusion, I would say, a very unimpressive conclusion and that we actually need a lot more and so yeah okay yeah well that's great so i mean the plan for today is eric has like some slides that he's gonna pull up and we're just gonna like walk through these slides and think about them and i don't know how far we're gonna get but we're just gonna kind of roll with that and yeah anything like any preliminary thoughts or anything you want to say before we just dive right into it uh no i think we're good man let's go ahead and dive in let's do it so oh, I guess you're waiting on me to pull up the slides. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So my bad. Um, no, here we go. Good. Here's your slides and yeah, we'll just go. So two approaches to the resurrection. Um, we'll talk about the minimal facts first and then I'll hopefully at the end, we'll be able to talk about maximal data and kind of what are the differences between minimal facts and uh, what a maximal data approach is, uh, why it's called maximal data and all of that good stuff. Uh, but I at least want to offer a critique of minimal facts here. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for that. So uh, what is a minimal fact? Well, um, it's something that's 90% of scholars, scholars acknowledge, and it would include scholars across the uh, theological spectrum or whatever. So it could be um, atheists, agnostics, Jews, Muslim scholars um, would all acknowledge, you know, the, these facts. It would be a heterogeneity of, of different people. Uh, I have Fred Flintstone there because uh, – Mike Lacona would call something like that uh, historical bedrock. Um, mm. So it's kind of a lame pun there. But um, what are the minimal facts? Um, well, Mike Lacona, Gary Habermas, um, they're usually going to use these facts here, which is number one, Jesus died by crucifixion, that the disciples believe that they experienced the resurrected Jesus, and that Paul, um, who was an unbeliever, also believed that he experienced the resurrected Jesus and converted. And so those three facts are pretty much facts that nobody can test right there. Um, so what are the best explanations? Um, is it really the best explanation? What Habermas um, will say is that he can rebut all of the major contenders uh, for al alternative hypotheses to the resurrection just by using these facts. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's where I would say he's wrong. I, I don't think that you can say that you can rebut all of these with just these three facts alone. I think we're going to need to bring in a lot more data than that. Mm. So, so the big to... problem is like when you look at the minimal facts is like you can't re like you're not gonna be able to rebut everything like me thrown out from like a skeptical hypothesis like to these minimal facts so we need to go like something more than that yeah i mean for example um let's just say that somebody could say that paul had some kind of a hallucinatory experience and peter had a hallucinatory experience and then it was just kind of a group delusion or something like that um i don't think that a person who's using just minimal facts um, is going to say that their explanation is necessarily like leagues better. I mean, at, at best, it might be like slightly better. And it really, as we'll see in a little bit here, um, it's it's not. It just kind of leaves you at an impasse. And mm -hmm. somebody could really just say, you know, I don't really know what happened. 
and I'm good with that. And I, I think a minimal facts person really has nothing to say at that point. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to take a little bit of a side detour here. Um, when it comes to investigating miracle claims, what some people will do is they'll set the bar so high and they'll be like this guy right here. Um, who's David Hume will say something like, it's always more probable that testimony, um, it would be like false because it's like a lie or a mistake than an actual miracle have happened. Right. And then mm -hmm. he'll also say things like miracle claims of one religion tend to cancel out or undermine miracle claims of, of another. Like he just kind of like tries to water it down because there's miracle claims in other religions. So now a common response to that is just because there's such a thing as fool's gold, gold doesn't mean that we can't determine if something or not is real gold. We can actually look at things through a rigorous historical criteria to weed out unpromising candidates of what an actual miracle claim is. Like say, for example, the miracles of Apollonius of Tiana, right? Well, the first reports that we get of the miracles of Apollonius of Tiana come um, from Philostratus writing about 100 years after Apollonius was dead. Uh, he's writing in Greece, if I remember correctly. A lot of Apollonius's miracles are happening in like all kinds of other places besides Greece, and India and, all, and what have you. And so that's not really a promising place to start, right? Uh, we want something to be early. We want something to be close to the actual events that it was reported. And we want it to also not fit in with the prejudices of the people who are reporting the miracle claims. But another thing that we, um, oh, looks like I already said that on this slide. I probably didn't need it. <laughs> Dissident events, belated reports, Plinian's already established. Uh, but the other thing that we don't want is we don't want a vague report, right? Um, you want details. If somebody says that a miracle happened, you, you're going to want to know like, okay, what exactly happened? Who, who did this happen to? What are the details? Who are the witnesses? Um, what you don't want is just kind of some sort of vague thing. Like I'm thinking of like, uh, there's reports of Joseph Smith uh, healing the sick in, um, I forget the name of the town, but it's in Illinois. And that's what we got is just like a crowd of people. He went door to door with people who were sick and they got healed. Well, we don't know their names. Uh, we don't know really any of the details, what they were, you know, what was going on. And so that would be a vague report. And it's just an unpromising candidate that I think we, don't really need to do a serious investigation on. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. Now, you're going to see in a second here how this ties into the minimal facts. Uh, Habermas says that very soon afterwards, Jesus' disciples had experiences that they believed were appearances of the resurrected Jesus. And here's Lacona saying historians may conclude that subsequent to Jesus' execution, a number of his followers had experiences in individual and group settings that convinced them that Jesus had risen from the dead and appeared to them in some manner. Now, notice how very carefully that's worded. Um, they believed and in some manner. Um, so why do a lot of scholars believe that the disciples had experiences of the resurrection? Well, they're basing it, as we probably are aware of, and most people who are interested in apologetics and know a little bit about resurrection apologetics are aware of, is they're basing this on a creed in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, um, which is for I handed to, unto you as of first importance, what I had received. So Paul received this tradition. Um, most scholars think that it's early, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and then the 12. And then perhaps this other stuff here was added on later. But um, the majority of scholars are going to say, yes, it's early. Yes, that's probably not Paul. Um, but if you've paid attention to like, say, Dale Allison pictured here um, in his book uh, on the resurrection apologetics, his most recent one, is he'll point out that it's definitely not very detailed. He'll, he'll say that we have very, very sparse evidence um, because he basically thinks that the Gospels aren't really reliable testimony. And so it's a vague report. So if it's a vague report, then a skeptic, I think, if, if this is the best that we could do is with minimal facts, is they're completely justified, just as I would be justified to just dismiss somebody who said, well, you know, there was this Marian apparition. Oh, okay, well, give me some of the details. Well, I don't really have a lot of the details, right? It's the same kind of thing. Without a detailed details of their testimony, um, I don't really think that anybody has to investigate this further. Um, and there's some other huge problems here. 
uh, there's a lot of scenarios that are very consistent with the appearance fact. For example, a floating non-speaking Jesus. Um, well, if he's floating, like <laughs> what, what exactly is going on there? Like that would kind of be more confirmatory that he's dead because he's not touching the ground. You know, um, he, he's more like a ghost or something like that. Uh, and he doesn't even speak and he just kind of is there for a second and then he goes away. Another scenario that's consistent with 1 Corinthians 15 because again, that's not a very detailed report that Paul gives us. It's just a Jesus who appears only once very briefly and speaks just a few words to his disciples and then completely disappears. Um, that's completely consistent with 1 Corinthians 15 because Paul is just giving us a creed. He's not giving us a lot of details whatsoever. Um, and so details matter. If we're not able to say in detail what the experiences were like, then it becomes extremely difficult to evaluate the rationality of the disciples' belief. Hmm. Um, and so if, if that's the that's the Achilles heel of minimal facts. Does that make sense so far, Zach? What I'm saying? Yeah, no, I think I think that's really helpful because like you look at the minimal facts and you could say, um, we're taking like really broad strokes when looking at the minimal facts, looking at um like generally agreed upon facts, but like with the minimal facts, like say they're all true, but like the gospel, like there's still that question of like if they didn't get the details right, then like, who cares? Um, and it's, it's really going to be harder to see. Whereas if like the details um, are going to help us see, like they paint an accurate picture, that's going to really help us to see like why the disciples actually believed in the resurrection. Yeah, exactly. If, if it's, if it's a vague report. We don't know what the details are like. We just don't know how rational they were to, to believe it. I mean, it's, it's just really that simple. That's the main Achilles heel. That's the one thing that if, you don't get anything else. Uh, your audience doesn't get anything else. That's the, what I want to get. And so we have to we have to bring in something different. And so minimal facts uh, will say uh, proponents will say that we can't know with confidence the details um, if we're just using minimal facts. Now, if, if you want to go back from using minimal facts and and then start to add on other details, um, that's fine. But now you're out of that ninety percent of the consensus of scholars. So why even st my, my argument is why even start there in the first place? Mm -hmm. So this is Mike Lacona in his big book on the resurrection. Um, he says, we may affirm with great confidence that Peter had such an experience in an individual setting. And we'll see the same can be said of the adversary uh, of the church, Paul. We can likewise affirm that there was at least one occasion when a group of Jesus's followers, including the 12, had such an experience. Did other experiences reported in the Gospels occur as well? such as the appearances to the women or Thomas, the Emmaus disciples, or the multiple, uh, this is kind of a big one here, or the multiple group appearances um, in 1 Corinthians 15 and John, where did those experiences occur? Like he's even admitting, like we don't even know. Um, historians may be, go, be going beyond what the data warrants in assigning a verdict with much confidence to these questions. And so if we can't know about the detailed multi-sensory appearances that happened across time um I, I think we're in a pretty pretty rough spot now um another thing that i notice uh, that minimal facts proponents will do uh is they don't use the most specific version of the piece of evidence that's actually relevant to the conclusion that's actually in question and so what you'll often see um lay people do um, and even some of the minimal facts apologists do, or even like the core facts apologists do, like Craig is they'll quote Gerd Ludemann here. Um, Gerd Ludemann is a uh, atheist New Testament scholar um, who's written and debated ex extensively against the resurrection. Um, but he is quoted um, as saying, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and his disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Um, but in the same book, Ludeman says that the objectification of the gospel resurrection accounts is a result of later embellishments, i.e. the physical details such as eating and being tangible. And he insists that the original seeing um, in the same book was some kind of religious ecstasy and in some cases, individual hallucination. And so using this particular phrase, just it sounds good. It sounds impressive. Wow. Even a skeptic like Ludeman admits that they have these appearances have happened. Mm -hmm. um, but when you defuzzify a little bit and you like zoom in, um, Ludemann's, what he's really saying is like, no, Jesus is dead. Like he, the details of what I think the testimony were like um, are absolutely completely different. 
And what that's like is it's, it's, it's really illegitimate. And so suppose, and I'm sorry if I'm going to have to read this kind of long wall of text here, but uh, suppose that you have a piece of evidence of a specific proposition that John is from a city in Ireland that's almost entirely Protestant. And this, this illustration comes from Lydia McGrew. Um, but instead of describing the evidence in that way, you describe it as, well, John is from Ireland. You could then argue that since most Irishmen are Roman Catholic, then John is probably Roman Catholic. But this is illicit by deliberately giving the evidence in a fuzzy form and leaving something out. It makes it sound like you have a very strong premise for your desired conclusion, when in fact stating the evidence in the specific form in which you really have it would show the evidence points in the, exactly the opposite direction. And so that's exactly what we're doing when we're quoting these um, skeptical scholars and saying, look, they affirm the resurrection appearances. Well, yeah, in a very, you're, 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 you're kind of cherry picking the data and you're just kind of picking the points that it sounds like they agree with you, but when you scratch beneath the surface, of course, they don't agree with you. Um, and I, I just think that that's kind of like, it's, it's a little bit pointless. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense because you know they want to use scholars like normal facts, like you want to use the scholars that disagree with you. Um, but then like they disagree with you, um, and you're trying to use them to build your case. But at the same time, like you have this issue of like they they, they know all the stuff you do, but they come to a different conclusion, and um, they may see like the idea of like the disciples like having experiences, like they see that totally differently than like Gary Habermas would see the disciples having experiences. So it's not like exactly the same idea. Right. Right, exactly. And so what I'm saying is um, it's illicit to include experts that don't support your conclusion. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, one scholar, as they experience what they believe were appearances, will be no better explained if there was no resurrection. Oops. Now, I'm going to have to skip that part because uh, the audio won't play on your side there. Um, but yeah. in this quick clip with Polygia, um, Polygia, I believe, was on the Myth Vision podcast um, and with Mike Lacona. And he was basically asking him, um, can we know about the, the physical details uh, in the Gospels um, and uh, that they're not embellished um, is, is the question. And Lacona says it's impossible that we could know if they're not embellished. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think about that for a second. And so if it's impossible to know that the details of the testimony that we have aren't unembellished, then it's impossible to assign the resurrection hypothesis with any kind of strong probability. Um, and if you think about where would embellishments be, well, a skeptic is going to go probably where the miracle claims are, right? Um, that's probably where the biggest embellishments are, and that's what they do say. And so to say that it's impossible to know, and yet at the same time infer that the, say that the inference to the best explanation is the resurrection hypothesis, um, I think is is kind of crazy. Um, I'm not saying Lacona's crazy. I think he's an extremely intelligent person um, and a really good guy. Um, but I don't think his conclusions can be supported at all. Um, now, someone might say, well, wait a second. Uh, why would the disciples believe X if the resurrection didn't happen? Um, sorry that the my little thing is covering it up mm -hmm. there. Um, but anyways, why would they believe in a crucified messiah you know like isn't a messiah like if you're crucified you couldn't be the messiah because being crucified is being cursed by god right or why would the messiah raise from the dead um they, they didn't expect this idea of like a two-step resurrection where jesus was raised from the dead and then eventually he'll come back and raise everybody else from the dead and nt Wright will point stuff like that out like they would have never have just made this up on their own because it was completely foreign to Judaism of that time, right? Mm -hmm. Or why would they ever uh, worship a crucified Messiah and hold them as divine? Like that necessarily wasn't a big strand of thought in Judaism. So all these different mutations in Jewish belief um, are better explained if the resurrection happened because they just would have never believed it unless something really, 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 really extraordinary happened. Does that make sense? I mean, you've probably mm -hmm. heard arguments similar to that, right? And mm -hmm. so um, this is a clip that I can't uh, play, unfortunately, um, but it's an interview with um, Gary Habermas and Cameron Bertuzzi on capturing Christianity, where um, basically, and this it's Bart Ehrman response to it with uh, Apologia, uh, but basically it's an argument where um, Habermas is saying that this was the fuse, that the resurrection is the fuse that was lit for all of these different mutations of Jewish belief 
to, to morph into Christianity. And it doesn't make sense unless the resurrection actually happened. And what I'm saying and uh, what like McGrew has pointed out is that this is just bottlenecking. Okay. And so the bottleneck problem is that the upper limit of the case that you can reach with this is simply that the disciples believed it. You, you could add all this evidence. You could stack all this evidence of how the, these beliefs changed, but it doesn't change the fact that th they were rational to do so. And even Ehrman points it out in this, this clip that um, I should have sent to you ahead of time. I apologize. Yeah, um, but, but basically he's just like, yeah, they believed it. Of course they believed it. But Ehrman's like, we don't know if they're rational to believe it. And so he's just making the same case that McGrew would make. Um, was Herod rational for thinking that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead, right? Were the crowds rational for thinking that Jesus was one of the prophets come back to life? Um, we see that in the Gospels. And so all of this stacking of evidence uh, or of what the disciples believed is not enough, okay? It's, it's not enough to know what the, why, what the disciples believed. We just need, it goes back to not to beat a dead horse. We just need to know that they are rational to believe it. So to give an illustration, uh, let's just say Serena uh, thinks that she saw a ghost due to some experience that she recently had. Um, maybe you don't know Serena very well, but she seems like a pretty intelligent, normal, rational person. But you're unable to find out the details regarding her claim. Maybe you were having a conversation with her at work and um, then, you know, she gets pink slipped or something or she, you know, you don't get to finish the conversation with her. OK, um, is that really a good reason to think that ghosts are real? Um, just because she kind of mentioned this thing in passing um, without any like explicit details of what the experience was like. I, definitely not. Right. Um, what if we added the fact that she was a Jehovah's Witness? Right. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, they think that they're basically like materialist in the sense of like, you know, they don't believe that there's ghosts because they think when somebody dies, they just get buried until whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they don't believe that ghosts are real, but that, does, that doesn't get us any further. It might get us like a little bit further that she probably wouldn't be inclined to believe this. But in the absence of more specific details about her claim, we don't know if she's rational for her belief in ghosts. Uh, more and more details about her sincere belief just doesn't get us there. And so you, you'll, you'll see like somebody like Mike Lacona will say, well, you know, Paul, he preached bodily resurrection, right? He was real strong about bodily resurrection. And the disciples, they gave him the right hand of fellowship. You know, he met with James and Peter and John at, in, at uh, Antioch and uh, he submitted his gospel to them. And they were like, yeah, yeah, you know, Paul, you're, you're preaching the same gospel that we are. Um, and so the disciples must have believed in bodily resurrection too. Well, again, that's just saying that showing that they believe it. And so it's not enough to argue that the gospels, and this is another thing that Lacona will do is they'll say, well, you know, even though we can't say that the resurrection accounts in the gospels, uh, we don't know for sure if they're embellished or not. That goes beyond what historians are able to say. There's this motif, you know, there's this theme, um, and they portray Jesus's resurrection as physical while carefully saying, you know, that we don't know if they're not embellished, like that's, that's not going to cut, cut it either. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That's just, again, more bottlenecking, right? You can only get the upper limit uh, of all this data that you're adding is just that they believed it. Right. Uh, I've mm -hmm. seen the Kona do this one too, where he says, well, the apostolic fathers taught bodily resurrection and that we know that the disciples were taught by the apostolic fathers. You know, you have Polycarp. He was a student of uh, Irenaeus was his student. And Polycarp says that, um, you know, was, or, and Irenaeus says that Polycarp was a student of John. And so, you know, this goes all the way back. And it, again, it's just the upper limit is that they believed it, like big whoop de doo So does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and what I'm thinking is for this, Eric, let's try to like, maybe like do in the next like six minutes, like kind of wrap up against like the problem with the mineral facts and then try to get in the maximal data for the second half, if that works for you. Yeah, well... Uh, I'm pretty much there. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. There you go. Oh, look at that. Look at the next slide. It's just like. Crazy. Yeah. Yep. So we're there. Um, so the alternative is maximal data, right? Uh, and what maximal data does is it contends there's very strong evidence that the gospels and acts are written by individuals who, oh, there's a typo there. Don't mind that. Who are closer to the facts, well-informed and habitually scrupulous. This would provide evidence that confirms the claims in the gospels and acts concerning the resurrection and ascension, and this is an important distinction here, reflect eyewitness testimony. Um, you know, we're not begging the question here. Uh, we're not just saying that 
you know, the gospels are reliable. Therefore, what they report is necessarily true. Uh, we're just saying that it reflects um, the actual original reports, right? And so there's three explanations, and this is the, the Paleyan approach, right? There's William Paley. Um, for those in your audience who don't know William Paley, uh, besides writing his book on natural theology and the, the whole watchmaker argument, um, he also wrote a book called The View of the Evidences of Christianity, um, which is an excellent book you can get for free on Google Play. Um, it is uh, public domain, so it doesn't cost you a dime. Um, Paley argues that either the disciples were liars um, or they were mistaken or that Jesus really rose from the dead, right? And so the content of the disciples' claims uh, makes it very unlikely that they were mistaken, right? They claim to have multiple or multiple multi-sensory experiences, both in individuals and groups on multiple occasions, conversing with Jesus, talking with Jesus, eating with Jesus, um, you know, passing the fish, touching his wounds, all of these things. And they gave details of these encounters find in the gospel accounts. And so if these details reflect the eyewitness testimony, then it's very improbable that they were simply mistaken. Whereas the minimal facts, um, I think it's very, very, very difficult to rule out that they were not honestly mistaken. Now, the context of their claim uh, makes it very difficult to say that they were liars. Uh, they undertook serious risk of death for making these claims and continue to do so in the face of great persecution, making it very highly improbable that they were lying. Now, I'm not saying that all of the 12, well, 12, the 11 or whatever, were necessarily martyred, um, but they undertook labors, dangers, sufferings, and some did uh, ultimately suffer martyrdom. Uh, I think we have good evidence for Peter and Paul, um, at the very least, and James. Um, and so they were willing to take serious risks. And so if they were not liars and if they were not mistaken, um, then the best explanation is that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, so what a skeptic will often do is if you're going to disbelieve the resurrection, then their best bet is to hang on to the mistaken option by saying that they really didn't experience those things. And they didn't even claim to experience those things. Um, to remain skeptical, the non-Christian could simply argue that all of the details that are added in, you know, like Luke and John um, and the book of Acts um, were added later. Um, and so we don't know if it was rational for the disciples to believe that Jesus was risen. Um, they'll, they'll even like Paul. They'll be like, yeah, let's just stick with Paul's testimony and say that he was the only eyewitness and, um, and that the earliest reflection of the belief is 1 Corinthians 15. And they'll try and just act like it's all visionary, right? Um, which in their mind just amounts to hallucinatory or just non veridical or something like that. Um, and so this is the importance of where the gospel accounts come in. Um, are all those physical details uh, legendary embellishment? Oops, excuse me. And so, and I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, and so here's Paladia picture here. He's very famous for the, for the Bible tells me so jingle. And this is probably where somebody like Apologia would hit me with the for the Bible tells me so. Is this just a for the Bible tells me so argument? Well, no, I'm not at all saying that you have to accept the Gospels uh, just by faith. Uh, what I am saying is that what we can do is we could tell what the authors were like by looking for different clues in their documents. Now, this argument, um, it, it's not popular, right? I mean, that's kind of the point of Dal Dale Allison's book on the resurrection is he doesn't think that the evidence supports that the gospels are really written, um, especially the resurrection accounts aren't reflective of eyewitness testimony, right? And a lot of scholars won't do that. And this is why I think people like minimal facts is because it has that rhetorical punch of, you know, we got this big amount of scholars, but I think that is confusing um, sociology with an epistemological fact. Um, mm -hmm. And the happenstance of scholarly politics doesn't constrain the force of objective evidence, the fact that something is not granted by skeptical and liberal scholars doesn't mean that it's weakly supported by non-question begging evidence, nor does it mean that it's just based on a theological presupposition like inerrancy or something like that. Um, in fact, you don't have to be an inerrantist and you could still uh, be a maximal data person um, and, and several are. So um, here is Richard Bauckham. He says that consensus has as much to do with the sociology of knowledge as it does with the compelling nature of the hypothesis. And so um, I, I, I care less about 
what consensus has to say than the actual arguments themselves and and how that they arrived to that. I'm not saying that consensus isn't important at all, um, but we have to look, we can't argue by proxy. We actually have to look at the arguments themselves. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, I think that it's helpful thinking about like Max Modetta. I mean, it's, it's worded really nicely saying, hey, let's look at like um, like all the data and like everything that's going on in like the gospels and things like that. And yeah, so, I mean, I think that makes sense. And then you're looking at like saying, well, like with the idea of consensus, like, yeah, I mean, m- most people may not accept this, but so what? Like if we have good data to support it, then here we go. We're getting running. Like every good movement, like wasn't the majority view at one point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, these, these uh, Strauss, you know, when he first started out was not, he was going against the consensus, right? And he was the mm-hmm. one of the first, you know, quest for historical Jesus, demythologizing this kind of stuff. And so, um, yeah, we just have to look at the data independent of who's holding it. Um, whoop. Sorry. Um, so just real quick objections to maximal data that, that I'll often hear um, is that it takes way too long. Um, the p- thing that people have with minimal facts, and it's really hard for them to let go of, is they think, well, if you take this away from me, um, you know, I, I'm going to have to take forever and ever and ever um, to go over my case. Well, I think as you saw, just that I was able to go over it with you in like an elevator pitch version. Mm-hmm. within just a couple of minutes, you know? Yeah. And so it doesn't matter if it's, first of all, it doesn't matter if it's going to take long um, because <laughs> for the reasons that I laid out, you're going to have to give people more information anyways, more data anyways, to give them a robust case. Um, and so taking a maximal data case also could be more efficient because you're going to be moving more quickly to the point where you actually need to be in finding out what the skeptic will or won't admit. So um, I don't really buy the it takes too long thing. Um, and as you'll see in a moment here, I'll give you kind of a little bit of an evidence sampler um, of things and um, to kind of whet the appetite. And I, it's not as if we're going to be in these conversations closing the deal with a skeptic, you know, right then and there anyway. So um, now another objection that people will say is, well, you know, what about all the contradictions? You know, they're, they're, that's what they're going to want to bring up, right? They're going to go, well, what about all the contradictions in the Gospels? Um, but the skeptic doesn't dictate to you how and when you will answer an alleged difficulty in your presentation. Um, you could just say, Hey, I'm presenting a positive case. Um, and so I'm not conceding anything here for the sake of argument. We could definitely talk about contradictions. Um, but I think that after you see the fact that I have uh, a very positive, uh, a very powerful, positive case. Um, I think your concerns about contradictions might already kind of evaporate a little bit. And the thing that, um, too, Zach, is that like we would expect uh, a little bit of disagreement among eyewitnesses when it comes to eyewitness mm-hmm. testimony anyways. Yeah. And so uh, having some contradictions is not uh, really that strong of a, a, a complaint because that's what you would expect with eyewitness testimony anyways. It would actually be kind of surprising if there were no uh, apparent discrepancies. Does that, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And and so I don't think that you have to like, just because they can say, well, let's talk about all these contradictions first. You don't have to resolve all those first. Make your positive case. Uh, and then I think that epistemic weight of that positive case, plus letting them know that you would expect some of this anyways. Uh, and then when you really get into some of the contradictions, like Bart Ehrman's book, Jesus Interrupted, um, I have a friend who has a very heavily annotated uh, version <laughs> of it with all the contradictions. Ehrman calls it a world of contradictions. Well, if it's a world of contradictions, then yeah, maximal data is sunk in the water. Um, but he says that after you really sift through them all, uh, through the tendentious readings and some of the overreadings and, and just some of the, 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 the arguments from silence and, and trivial things that Bart brings up, that really his list shrinks down to about five or six. Well, that's not enough to sink the case that we're making um, that are actually interesting candidates for contradictions. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to run into a few of, I'll give you like a brief evidence sampler and I'm going to probably skip around in my slides for the sake of time mm-hmm. here. Yeah. Um, but I will give you a few and I'm going to stick with the book of Acts um, for this. Um, and so some of the uh, different evidences are external confirmations. Those are like um, historical details um, that we can confirm uh, in, in real history that are in the gospels that show that they're eyewitness, like 
and uh, little details, and I'll kind of talk about those. And then there's undesigned coincidences. We'll talk about briefly the principle of restraint. And I probably won't have time to get through these others, um, but I do have videos on all of these different things on my uh, YouTube channel that people can check out. So I'm mm -hmm. going to focus on acts um, just for the purposes of this short discussion here. So why would I want to focus on acts? Well, Luke and acts come from the same writer. There's good evidence from the we passages that Luke really traveled with Paul. If acts comes from a meticulous historian who seemed to have firsthand knowledge of at least some of the life and doings of Paul, this should increase Luke's credibility. Also, Luke very clearly in his prologues uh, states his commitment to factual truth. And I don't think that we could just disregard that. And if it could be demonstrated that Luke really was a traveling companion of Paul, it would be very surprising if his understanding of the apostolic claim concerning the resurrection differed significantly from that of Paul. You'll often hear that Paul, you know, he had this kind of fuzzy view of the resurrection and it was later apologetics that caused somebody like Luke to put all these embodied embellished details. Um, Luke also claims to have been present with Paul during Paul's visit to the Jerusalem church in Acts 21, when all the elders, including James, were present. Uh, that's Acts 21, 18. Luke was also present with Paul during his imprisonment in Caesarea Maritima for at least two years, uh, during which time he would have had ample opportunity to access many of the living witnesses to Jesus' resurrection and perhaps even uh, Jesus' mother, Mary. Um, since Caesarea was only 75 miles from Jerusalem, uh, where many of the witnesses um, of the resurrection resided. Now, Luke provides the physical details surrounding Paul's conversion as well. Uh, the, the traveling companion saw a light and heard a voice following the three days of blindness and was cured by Ananias when he prayed for him and what the voice said. And so it's a lot more than what we get from like the book of Galatians where Paul just very briefly talks about, he revealed his son in me or, you know, or I think he says in first Corinthians nine, one, I saw the Lord, but there's not a lot of details there. Whereas the conversion story, we, we get, a lot more miraculous happenings going on. Uh, Luke also differentiates the post-ascension visionary experience of the polymodal appearances that were extended across the 40 days. And so um, here's Bart Ehrman real quick. Uh, he says that the author of Acts is just simply claiming to be a traveling companion of Paul's and giving an un, um, unusually well. So he's making himself out to be that this is, I'm in a place to know here, you know, and Paul is, or Ehrman here is just saying that's a bad argument because he was writing at 85, probably decades after Paul's death, which I don't really see that being a problem, but I do think there's good arguments for the early dating of Acts. I'll have a video on that coming out real soon here. Um, but on the other hand, he says that he's too poorly informed about Paul's theology and missionary activities to have been someone with uh, firsthand knowledge. Well, was he really um, poorly informed about his missionary activities. Well, I don't think that's the case at all. Uh, Colin Hemmer, um, a uh, classical historian, has a book, The Book of Acts in the Setting of Hellenistic History, which I highly recommend. Uh, he shows that Luke gets 84 difficult facts correct. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but I will go through a few here. Uh, like local titles, Luke gets the proper designation for the magistrates of the colony as strategoi, um, Following the general term Archontes in verse 19, he gets the proper term polytarchs, use of the magistrates in Thessalonica. These are all local, localized terms that were particularly local in that area. Uh, the term Areopagites, which is derived from Arios Pegos, this is the correct title for a member in the court in Athens. He correctly identifies Gallio as the proconsul resident in Corinth, an illusion that lets us date the events to the summer of 51 AD to the spring of 52 AD, since that is when Gallio served as the proud council of Ikea. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, I have several here, as you could tell. Whoops. Um, but there's there's all of these other little details. Uh, I'll, I'll run through a few of these real quick here. Local beliefs and custom. Luke knows that the two gods known to be associated with Lystra in particular were Zeus and Hermes. These are paralleled epigraphically from Lystra itself. And the grouping of these names of Greek divinities are particularly characteristic of the L Lystra district, right? Uh, when they call Paul a seed picker um, when he's uh, in Athens, uh, that was like a slang word that they use specifically in that area. Uh, the shrines and images of Artemis in Ephesus, the terracotta images uh, abound in archaeological evidence. Um, we have archaeological evidence of the altar to an unknown god. And on and on it could go. I could, I would probably bore you with all the details. I, I want to share this one though that I find really fascinating. Uh, this is Luke 27, 13 through 16. It says, When a moderate south wind came up, 
Supposing that they attain their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, close in shore. But before long, they rushed down from a land of violent wind called Arakilo, or I, your Aquilo. I, I might be. <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> I looked it up one time. I had to pronounce it in the video correctly, and now I can't remember. But mm -hmm. um, and when the ship was caught in it, they could not face the wind, and they gave way to it, let themselves be driven along, running under the shelter to a small idol named Kata. Now, what's interesting about Kata. Uh, as you can see here, is that it's more than 20 miles west-southwest of where the storm likely struck the travelers in the Bay of Masara. This is precisely uh, where the trajectory of a northeastern should have carried them. Um, and it isn't the sort of information that someone would have inferred without being carried there, carried there by the wind themselves. And in fact, the ancients found it very difficult to locate. Um, Pliny the Elder and Ptolemy both got the locations like way off. when, And these were people who were like, geographers of their time right mm -hmm. it's only luke in acts that actually gets this particular detail correct um and it's obviously best explained uh by the fact that luke was actually there um i'm gonna skip through some of this stuff here um oops, i keep hitting back somehow now often what's brought up um from skeptics as well isn't this you know the spider-man fallacy you know um, you know, just because, uh, people can talk about places like New York or, um, real people from New York or real places in New York, does that necessarily mean that, you know, superpowers and all of that other stuff is true? Well, this is just kind of silly. I, um, Tim McGrew calls this the Wikipedia fallacy. Um, mm -hmm. these are hard facts to get correct, right? Uh, back then they didn't have modern libraries. They definitely didn't have Google. They definitely had didn't have Wikipedia. And the whole genre of highly realistic historical fiction um, was not something that existed yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It, it's interesting. Like, it's helpful, like, going through that example of the island, like, off of Crete, looking at, like, hey, there's, like, these really little details um, that it seems like if you're just kind of, like, if you're mistaken or you're just kind of writing up a story that it seems very unlikely you get them right. But if you're, like, writing, like, history, well, you know, that's kind of what we'd expect. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think I'm tracking with you. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, if anything, he's going through this like landmine of different areas, traveling with Paul all around the Roman empire. Um, this is where you would expect him to get a lot of different things wrong. And when you look at things like the apocryphal gospels or apocryphal writings, um, like the acts of Thomas, for example, uh, mentions like King Gundas forest and like the land of India. Um, but it doesn't get into like, all of these confirmable details that we would have here. Um, now we'll quickly talk about undesigned coincidences. Then we'll go one over one more and then we should be uh, probably good for any sort of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Now undesigned coincidences, your audience may or may not be familiar, but sometimes two works by different authors interlock in a way that would be very unlikely if one of them were copied from the other or both were copied from a common source. For example, one book may mention in passing a detail that answers some question raised by the other the two records uh, fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And so um, say you have um, two friends who they're uh, decided to meet um, and they went to like a minor league baseball game and they were going to talk about um, something that um, a certain situation that was like a really bad situation, kind of an extraordinary situation. Right. Um, and let's just say that one of the friends tells you, that look, you know, I got this foul ball. Um, we were sitting in so, such and such place and the ball came towards me and I got it. Uh, but they don't tell you any other details of just about the foul ball. And then the other friend is telling you the story about the discussion with the friend. Um, but they talk about how they got beer uh, spilled all over them. Um, and, you know, they just smell like beer for the rest of the night. Well, <laughs> if somebody's reaching for a ball or something like that, or, or everybody's kind of crowding to get it, uh, something like a spill like that could very easily take place. And so those different pieces, while not talking about both the beer uh, and the ball um, fit mm -hmm. together quite nicely that reflect more uh, of eyewitness testimony than if they were just making something up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I'll give a few examples of these. Uh, this is in second Corinthians three, one, it says, or do we need like some people letters of recommendation from you or from you for you ourselves are a letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. This is Paul writing to uh, the Corinthians. I think I, yeah, 2 Corinthians 3. And so what's interesting 
um, is if we go over to Axe, why did that go? I'm sorry. You good? That got like. I must have clicked something <laughs> way yeah. back. Holy Ooh. cow. All the way through. I might just skip it. <laughs> um, I'll skip it. Uh, Canva. What are you going to do with Canva? Yeah. So anyways, um, I can do it off the top of my head. But if you go to um, Acts chapter 18, and I believe it's 27, uh, it talks about um, that Apollos, there we go. Uh, when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, which is um, Corinth is the capital of Achaia, it says that the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote a letter of recommendation. Now, what's also interesting about this particular coincidence is that Paul in 1 Corinthians says that um, I planted and Apollos watered, but it's God who gives the increase. And so that actually jives also with Acts 18 because it says in Acts 18 that Paul was in Corinth in the first part of the chapter. And then later on, Apollos went on uh, and argued with Jews and different things like that. And um, he did a whole debate. And this is actually one of my favorite verses on apologetics as well, because he publicly debated and he was great help to the, the Corinthians there. Um, but anyways, you can see how those little details kind of just dovetail so uh, neatly together here. Um let me see here. Oh, yeah. And then this is another interesting one. Uh, this is Acts 18, 3 through 5. It says that Paul went to see them because he was a tent maker. As they were there, he stayed and worked with them every Sabbath and reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, suddenly Paul devotes himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So what is it exactly about Silas and Timothy that Paul goes from working full time with his hands with Priscilla and Aquila to, to just preaching full time. Well, we don't really know. Um, something must've happened. Uh, but we read in second Corinthians 11, seven through nine. Uh, it says that when the brothers from Macedonia, so he doesn't even name who it was. Uh, it says that he came and supplied what they need. Um, and so this dovetails nicely. Paul wasn't just a slacker all of a sudden. Um, no, it's people from Macedonia who we really, find out who is an ax that came, gave him a big offering. And I think it's even in Philippians four, um, which the Philippi was in Macedonia. Uh, it says that, you know, no of the other, none of the other churches were involved with giving and receiving to me it was, uh, with me. It's, it was you only. And so do you see how those like just dovetail really nicely together? Mm -hmm. It's way better explained on these being eyewitness testimony yeah. um, than anything else. Now, someone might say, well, aren't, couldn't have Luke just used Paul's letters? Um, well, the best argument against that is Bart Ehrman, because <laughs> Bart will tell you in all of the different ways that he thinks that they contradict. Now, I don't necessarily think that there's like anything in there that's like too difficult to reconcile. Um, but most scholars don't think that Luke was using Paul's letters. Mm -hmm. um, here's one more. Uh, and then we'll run through one more piece of evidence and then we'll um, should be through here. But uh, first Corinthians four seventeen says uh, for this reason, I have sent to you Timothy. Um, so Timothy has already been sent, but we see at the end of the letter in first Corinthians 16, 10, it says when Timothy comes. And so Paul expects this letter to arrive before Timothy does. So therefore it's really easy to infer that Timothy must have taken some indirect route to Corinth. And if you can see on my little map here, um, a lot of times you could just go from Ephesus to Corinth, um, by boat. And, and it's just kind of this more direct route. Uh, but if you actually turn to Acts 19 and also the beginning of chapter 20, um, it sees, we do see that Paul actually, or Paul, excuse me, Timothy actually took this indirect route going across the land. Um, and so that's why Paul mm -hmm. expected that to get, um, Timothy to get to them later. Um, and so it's just like this really interesting stuff. Uh, Lydia McGrew in her book, Hidden in Plain View, which I definitely highly recommend, uh, details 20 of these end design coincidences between Acts and Paul's letters. And then there's Hora Paul and I, uh, again, by the uh, aforementioned William Paley, who's got like, I think, 40 or more. 
Uh, and that's another book that you, people can get for free. Um, so one other thing here, principle of restraint. Um, it, what basically the principle of restraint means is that like there could be um, more information that was given um, than what um, Luke actually does, but he kind of like holds back. So for example, uh, with baptism, um, the disciples are baptizing in Acts from the beginning, but nowhere in Luke's gospel is it mentioned that Jesus and his disciples baptized. Uh, Luke contains no commission to baptize. Uh, we do see a commission to baptize at the end of Matthew and the long ending of Mark. If Luke really felt free to add incidents and put words in Jesus's mouth, it would have been very natural for him to add a reference to the importance of baptism on the part of Jesus's disciples. So if he was an embellisher, why don't we see that? But that's the exact thing that we don't see, right? Or what about Jesus's appearance to Peter? Uh, and then I'll just stop with this one. Luke mentions Jesus's appearance to Peter mentioned in first Corinthians 15, five, or excuse me, um, Paul mentions that. Uh, and oh, wait, I had it right the first time. Luke mentions it um, in Luke 24, 34, that Jesus appeared to Peter. Um, and Peter's obviously forgiven by the time we get to Acts, but we can only know by conjecture how it came about that Peter made it known uh, that they had seen Jesus after the resurrection, but the original private meeting wasn't available for publication. Uh, we do know that withholding details of a private conversation is something that happens all the time in real life. Uh, but if the gospel writers felt free to invent dialogues and scenes in order to fill in where information was missing, why would they have not done so here? And so I would say that restraint um, is more of an indicator of truthfulness than falsity. And so the thing about all of this, um, and I'll finish with this, you can you can put me back on like double screen. You can take the slides away if you want. Okay. The, the thing that I would say about this, and this is just, again, a small tip of the iceberg here. Um, Check out, like I said, McGrew's book, uh, Hidden in Plain View. Check out uh, Hammer's book. Uh, those are really good places. Is that when you have 84 of these different kind of facts, these are external confirmations, and you got 20 or so undesigned coincidences, right? Um, and, and all of these different things, you could come up and propose alternate hypotheses to say, you know, well, maybe it's this and maybe it's that or whatever. But I think it becomes really ad hoc if you just have to continue to multiply those kind of explanations over and over and over again. And I have like one explanation that explains all of these things on one fell swoop. So I'm not saying that there can't be alternate explanations for some of these details, but is it really all of them? <laughs> the, all, all of them cumulatively, where again, I have one hypothesis that just covers all of that data. Um, when you have to multiply all these different rescues, uh, again, it just becomes really ad hoc. And so I think this speaks more uh, for the historicity. And then I gave the reasons why that's important because Luke was in a very good position to know. Uh, and also there's the context of the per persecution. If Luke was traveling with Paul to the point where he's also being shipwrecked with Paul um, and he's before, you know, appearing, he's getting the details of Paul's court cases and different things like that. Well, he's also taking risks himself to put this message together. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, thanks, Eric. That's great. Um, I guess one question I have, I really appreciate everything you put together for this is I'm thinking about like undesigned coincidences. And one of the things I've like trying to get my mind around is sometimes with the argument, I wonder like, well, if like Luke is just like telling a story about what happened in this event and like Paul is talking about something similar in this, like, wouldn't there just naturally be overlap? Like there's nothing to explain. And I think you did a good job of kind of like elaborating a little bit on like why that isn't going to be enough to like kind of overturn the argument. But like, maybe you want to just talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the overlap? Um, yeah, so like, what, wouldn't there just naturally be overlap? Like, that's an objection I see to like undesigned coincidence. Like, there's just gonna be things like if they're both writing separate accounts, um, like naturally, there's gonna be things that like, maybe one source says that another doesn't, and they're gonna like appear to be like coincidences. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that in the case that there's like a few, like, you could take pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, um, random pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and make them fit together. Um, but you can't do that with the whole puzzle. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so just for the fact that there's just so many of them, um, I think that just kind of does away with that. Um, if Sure, a, a handful could be an accident. Um, but when you have dozens, um, it it's, starts to be kind of ridiculous to say that it's just kind of all overlap that just serendipitously fits together as well as it does. 
Okay. Um, anything else you want to bring up? I mean, I think you did a great job, like elaborating, like with minimal facts, we have this problem of like, um, you know, there's still like a lot of different other like options on the table and like the question of like, like what the gospels are actually like is super important. Like when we're considering like, did Jesus rise from the dead? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you did a great job presenting your case and then also for like maximal data saying like, Hey, we have to look at like the details and things like that. So I'll leave it to you. Like, is there anything else you want to like say or elaborate on before we wrap up here? Um, yeah, I would just say, um, I mean, I kind of already touched on it. Uh, there's just a lot of really good resources that you can avail yourself to um, on this particular topic. Um, and so uh, some books I recommend, um, Peter J. Williams, uh, Can We Trust the Gospels is a very good like introduction um, to some of the uh, arguments for the gospel reliability. Uh, Lydia McGrew's book, Hidden in Plain View, and really all of her books. Uh, she has a book, Eye of the Beholder, uh, which is an extremely uh, uh like rich book on defending the reliability of the gospel of John. I think you've even probably talked to her on, on a mm -hmm. previous show yeah. about that particular topic. Um, she's got a great book on that. And, and then the, her other book, the mirror of the mask is extremely good. Um, Paley's two books, the view of the evidences of Christianity, or I, Paul and I, um, the one about Kata that I mentioned uh, is also, it's found in um, the book that I've mentioned uh, hammers book, but it's kind of harder to get a hold of and it's pretty expensive. Um, I happened to like luck out one day and I got it for like, or for like $6 on Amazon. And so I almost did like a, uh, a Pentecostal church lady dance when I found a used copy of it for $6. But um, anyways, uh, there's a book, um, it's James Smith. I think it's The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul. It's an older book that's out of print that you can get um, that is a public domain that you could just find on Google Play. Um, and uh yeah, there's just a, a, a lot of books to avail yourself on this. Um, the other thing I would just say is don't be impressed by people, and I kind of brought this up before, that are just like, well, scholars don't really like this argument. Well, in my experience, scholars just aren't very familiar with this argument. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're just kind of dismissive of it because it's not something that's really something that they talk about. Because um, yeah. I've heard you know people on different... Uh, podcasts and different things like that, they'll bring it up and they're like, oh, well, you know, the McGrews, what do they know? Or, oh, those are old apologetic arguments um, mm -hmm. that have just been buried or whatever. And it's just like, what does that have to do with the specific argument? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. talk about the argument itself, the merits of it itself. And it, it, most of the time, they can't even articulate what the argument is. If you watch, like, the debate between Bart Ehrman and Tim McGrew about undesigned coincidences, my opinion, Bart just came completely unprepared and had no idea what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And so um, don't let the scholarly dismissiveness of this like be something that's intimidating. Just look at it upon its own merits and, and then make your assessment. And when they actually do respond to it, I would love to hear it. Most of them, I haven't seen too many responses to undesigned coincidences. I've seen a few here and there. And most of them, the treatments are like, well, I can explain this one and I can explain that one. And so, you know, it's, it's redaction or it's this, that, and the other. And they'll just deal with like two examples and then be like, well, I guess they're probably all like that. And I like, that is just fallacious reasoning. That's not the way that we, that's not the way that we're supposed to be reasoning here. Um, yeah. It's just kind of too dismissive. And so uh, don't let that kind of scholarly bullying that sometimes you see online um, with that throw you. Mm, yeah, I think that's great. We got to think for ourselves and really not just like fall into like tribalism and yeah, really explore these ideas. So thank you, Eric, for coming on. I really appreciate you um, taking the time here. Obviously, like your channels testify. I'm sure a lot of people are aware of it. I can congrats on a million views. That's super exciting, man. So yeah, congrats mm -hmm. to you. Well, praise God. So mm -hmm. yeah, well, thanks for having me on, Zach. And uh, and uh, yeah, um, it's always good to to be on and share. And um, yeah. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of yeah, doing yeah. the awkward Midwest goodbye. Midwestern. Like, where are we here. going? Are we ending mm -hmm. now? Or yeah, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's it, guys. So check out Eric's stuff. And yeah, if you encourage, if you feel like it here in projects, subscribe, like all that fun stuff. And if you value us, um, go become a patron at patreoncom slash projects. Your support helps a lot, and you can do it for a little as like a dollar a month. So that's it, everyone. Have a good one, and we'll catch you next time. God bless.